Okay, Queens, I am beyond excited to, well, I was going to say introduce you to Grace, but many of you have already watched our episode that me and Grace had together, oh my gosh, maybe nine to 10 months ago now. And um, Grace has come back on the podcast because Grace actually was a one-to-one -one client of mine after we first met through this method of, you know, podcasting. Um, and I asked her to come on and share her experience because I know it will be so valuable to so many that are struggling with anorexia. So Grace, welcome back to the Body Love Binge podcast. Thank you for having me again. I'm excited. Great to have you here. And so I'm going to start with, you know what's coming, 10 quick fire questions. Yes. Okay. Number one, if you could only eat one type of food for the rest of your life, what would it be? Uh, breakfast food, like cereal, or I love cereal. So I'd say that. Love. Number two, if you could, oh, this is a hard one. If you could only listen to one song. For the rest of your life, what would it be? <laughs> the thing is, I listen to songs like over and over again, and then I get sick of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it would have to be one of my dad's favorite songs. So, like, do you know the group Madness? Mm -hmm. Um, maybe one of their songs, or um, Four Seasons in One Day by Crowded House. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love the title of that one. Yeah, it's a nice song. Yeah. Okay, number three. If you could have any superpower for a day, what superpower would you choose and how would you use it? Um, I would talk to the dead and then talk to all of the family I've lost and dad. That would be nice. Oh. That's a beautiful superpower to have. Yeah, I think so. Okay, I'm not going to keep saying the numbers because I've already lost count and I've not got it in front of me. <laughs> so the next one is, what's the most spontaneous thing you've ever done and did it turn out well? When dad just passed away, mum and I went down to Cornwall like a few weeks afterwards and like we got a b and b bed and breakfast um i wouldn't say it was successful or unsuccessful it's just looking back that time seems so blurry and just the fact that we were like right let's just go down to cornwall um so that i'd say that's the most spontaneous thing yeah I love that, Grace. And I also notice, you know, what I'm going to pick up here. I noticed that through our coaching, when I advised you to remove the word successful out of your dictionary, you automatically actually didn't align with whether it was successful or not, which is huge yeah. in awareness. Yeah, definitely. OK, next one. If you were stranded on a desert island, standard question, and could yeah. only take three items with you, what would they be? can they be people or uh, well it says items, so I, d I suppose it if it depends if you want to label a person as an item well <laughs> that wouldn't be so nice maybe first aid um if mm -hmm. i get hurt or something blankets and like food rations, you know, you can have it for camping. I feel like that's a smart way. Yeah, to come until to you camp. learn how to catch your own food and all that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Smart. Okay. Oh, what's your favourite childhood memory that always brings a smile to your face? I mean, I enjoy all of our memories in Cornwall as a family, how we'd go down every every summer and we had friends down there. Um, there's one memory that always makes us laugh. We went to Lanzarote one time and in our villa pool, there's a picture that we've been trying to find for ages of my dad like falling backwards off of a lilo like a donut lilo and he just that was 
that was really funny at the time and still is now. So that's what came to mind. I love that. Okay, what's the funniest, almost embarrassing thing that has happened to you in public before? Oh, um, gosh, I probably blocked it out of my mind, whatever <laughs> it was. Yeah. I mean, it was always embarrassing when you you were younger in the playground and like primary school and peed yourself. That was embarrassing. That's all I could think about. Yeah, that's really embarrassing. I remember yeah. that. I don't think I do remember, actually. Maybe I blocked it out, too, but I'm with you on that. Yeah. I feel like I need to share mine, even though these are nothing about me, but I want to share because you will find it funny. I think the listeners will, too. So I was on a train not that long ago, last year, and the toilets in the train, they're like, they've got these huge doors and the toilet is really far away from the door. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the toilet, shut the door, locked the door, had a wee, and I'm mid-wipe. So, you know, as a woman, you like have to kind of half stand and, you you know, yeah. and the door flies open. Oh, and God. There's four people, three of them being men, stood directly outside, like in front of the door. And because it was so far away, the door, I'm like, have like my knickers are down like near my knees and I have to like scramble forward. Oh, and shut the door. Because what happened was, even though I shut the door and locked it, apparently it's an old door. You have to like really pull it and lock it. So I thought it was locked, but it wasn't. And the train went on a little bit of a rickety corner. And then I was like, right, do I stay in the toilet for the rest of my journey, which was another hour and a half? Or do I just walk out of there, own the shit out of what happened and go back to my seat? Guess which one I did? The second one. Oh, yeah. So I was like, right. Okay, so bearing in mind I'm in a different country as well, and not everyone speaks English, I, I went out the toilet and I just went, well, that was awkward, because everyone was like not wanting to look at me because they were awkward as well. And then <laughs> they just kind of laugh and I just like went back to my seat. But I just needed to share that because that is fucking embarrassing. That's <laughs> funny. And but you funny. Don't it, so it's fine. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so enough about me. Next question. If you were given the opportunity to learn any new skill instantly, what would you choose? Oh, that's difficult. Mm, maybe dancing, like just to be good at dancing without having to train or anything for it. You and are good at dancing. I've seen I <laughs> say magically I could be skilled at it yeah I get that but you put in the work and that's why you know you're awesome at dancing but I get it it's that everything in life you have to like put effort in to get something you know yes <laughs> okay so oh this is kind of a hard one I'm sorry not sorry what's the weirdest dream that you can ever remember having this isn't a hard one all of if he, my closest friends will probably know what I'm gonna say um although recently my dreams have been very vivid just thought I'd mention that my weirdest dream is it was at my house and I had friends with me and we were trying to stop the bookshelves from attacking the house there were <laughs> bookshelves trying to get in <laughs> um, and to get them away we had to like chant like we love netball we love netball and then they went away um, yeah that's so random that's pretty weird <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool that you remember it vividly though yeah yeah it's one of the first dreams I can remember that's so funny okay <laughs> uh, last question what do you want people to take away from the conversation we're about to have I uh, just say that anything is possible really and to see the development I've had since our first podcast call which is I never thought would be possible but mm, let's dive into that then so those that don't know you um yet can you briefly share like, why you came to me in the and, well in fact you didn't come to me that was a funny thing because we met through yeah. Instagram I was just helping you in the DMs I invited you on so I could coach you because it was easy to answer your question that way and we just kind of happened to work together but up until that point when we were speaking in the DMs can you share a bit about your story and what led you to to where you were then 
Yeah, so I was asking you um, if you could talk about the relation between grief and eating disorders because I lost my dad in August 2022 to pancreatic cancer. Uh, I was struggling with an eating disorder at the beginning of that year and then when he died, because um, he had cancer for two years, it was still quite quick when from when we knew he would he wasn't gonna beat it to when he died so mm. I got quite ill when I started college after that and went into hospital and the recovery process after it was quite up and down so then when I found um your page I was like oh she seems like she you understand even if you haven't gone through that sort of grief so yeah we were messaging and that's mm -hmm. where it started. But when your dad was diagnosed, was that was when is that when the eating disorder sort of started to rear its head? Did you think? Um, probably disordered eating did, mm -hmm. but I'd say my dad got diagnosed in lockdown, like the first one in twenty twenty, and then his cancer started deteriorating when my grandma died so in the beginning of 2022 but then when we were talking and I was telling you about the past it was quite obvious that I did have a bit of disordered eating but I would say it got more serious um mm -hmm. later on yeah and would you say like the disordered eating can you share like a few of the behaviors that that might if you can remember what that looked like for you because some so many of us you know think that we don't have an eating disorder or disordered eating, yes, there's a difference, but either way, unfortunately, diet culture normalized most disordered eating. So what did that look like for you, the onset before the anorexia really, you know, turned on? Yeah, it was very much diet culture, whereas it would be like, oh, new year, new diet. And then it was just one year where I went, very hard and then fell into the eating disorder but before it was like I'd be out with friends and we'd be snacking but I just feel myself compulsively having a lot more to the point where I'd feel unwell and then I'd get home and be really upset about it mm. and just myself I'm not going to do that again but then I'd do it again another time. Yeah, so it was like the restriction binge, restriction binge kind of cycle with thoughts that you're going to start again tomorrow, you're going to start again on Monday, that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then when it started to get worse, how was your internal world? So obviously you had a massive life-changing experience with your dad's diagnosis. Do you think that turning to restriction was a, a way to cope with your life at that time? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I went to counselling for it at first, you know, before assessing the actual actions that I was doing. And it was very much a control thing, um, just trying to fit into a world that doesn't have all of this other like shit going on with dad. Yeah. So it was almost like you were trying to create a, not necessarily a fantasy world, but you were just trying to norm out the reality that was too painful to be in. Yeah. 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 And then can you share with us your experience with inpatient treatment? Because there's loads of, you know, different um, opinions on inpatient treatment and everyone is different, of course, but I'm curious about your personal experience of, of that and how long you were there for. In the hospital because I'm under CAMS as well mm. so is that called outpatients or that's just was you did you stay in the hospital or did you have like a treatment center like based all around your life outside of hospital I went into hospital because the support I had outside with CAMS mm. sent me in right. as they felt it wasn't safe for me to get like to start eating at home mm -hmm. like they just they wanted to assess the refeeding process mm -hmm. so 
we had an appointment with CAMS and then they told me to go to the closest A&E, which mum and I did. And we were in A&E for 22 hours. Because <gasps> yeah. I had just, I was 16. So I was in the children's A&E, but I had to be on an adult ward, which was um, frustrating to say the least. Mm -hmm. And we were in there for, I think, just under five days. Um, and I refused to eat until I saw a dietitian because that's what I was told that they'd give me a meal plan, but because the NHS is quite busy, I um, didn't get it until literally the last day. And then I got released, but Cam's was saying like she needs to stay in there. But there was no way that Mum and I were going to stay in there. It was very stressful. Yeah. So were you fed through tubes then in the in there? No, because they they said that I I was compliant enough to mm -hmm. eat. I just needed to see a dietitian. Yeah. Um, and I said to you about what one of the doctors said to me when they checked my heart rate and all of mm. that she said um you have the heart rate of a marathon runner so you're not that bad you're quite fit and I was like obviously I wasn't so. oh god I mean I can't I literally have no words for that like I'm I'm like I have cold shivers right now because it just it's just so wrong to say that I know yeah and so tell me about that your point. experience. Oh, sorry, Grace, it stopped. And then I think I spoke over you. That's okay. What were you saying? Um, Tell me about your experience with a meal plan. So I know part of our work together was to get you off the meal plan, because although it was helpful at the beginning, you can become reliant on it. It's just another rule to follow, even though it might have been beneficial. So can you explain um how you or having the meal plan how it benefited you and actually would you have then chosen a meal plan if you knew the difference right from the get-go yeah I mean I think it was helpful at the beginning the meal plan to like get my weight up because um the eating disorder like I didn't have any hunger cues or all of that and then when I got weight restored and like the period and everything. I think I was clinging on to the meal plan quite a bit. Uh, I was thinking if I come off of it, then I'm just gonna go crazy with my food. And cause I heard you talk about the all in method and all of that. And I think if I was to do the all in like earlier without the meal plan, maybe it, this process would have been quicker but mm. obviously with your help I'm not on the meal plan anymore and I am still going through bits of extreme hunger but I'm dealing with it which is something I never thought I'd be able to do um, and it's not so scary anymore. Yeah that's oh incredible how far you've come Grace. So mm -hmm. when Think back to when we were start, when we started working together. So me and your mum were in contact, then we started working together. And um, the stage you were in then, did you ever think that you could be where you are now? No, I didn't, honestly. I thought that, you know, I'm sure you've heard it loads of times, that I'd be the only one it wouldn't work for, or mm -hmm. I didn't have the energy to put in the work for it. Because... Mm -hmm. um, I do still struggle with depression now and I just I thought if I wasn't doing all of the work all of the time then I wouldn't get better but I mean I have so yeah so can you explain how your relationship with food is currently and I know you said you know you're still you're still experiencing some extreme hunger and that's all part of the process but you're not alone in this I'm still supporting you it's a journey for sure but what's your relationship with food like now and then can you compare it to how it was when you were you were on your recovery journey already when when we met you were on a meal plan but in terms of how you think about food any shame judgment around food and how you can eat freely now yeah a perfect example is 
yesterday when mum and I were in Tesco's we bought some mint magnums mm -hmm. and if you remember one of the holidays I had to Bournemouth um I told you that we were on the beach and I wanted a magnum but I didn't allow myself one and you told me the next day you better have one <laughs> so me and my friend did and I just remember how anxious I was for it um and like internally I didn't show it and then yesterday when I had the magnum it just felt so normal it was just something to have after dinner and mum and I were kind of laughing about it how different it is oh my god it's incredible isn't it so what type of foods are you eating now that you perhaps in the eating disorder never thought you would you would eat again without it extreme guilt or fear yeah I mean takeaways are a big one even on the meal plan I didn't really allow myself takeaways um because I thought it didn't fit in with it but now with the with the extreme hunger it is more helpful in a way and I'm just learning to you know lay into it um and allow so it would be like takeaways and desserts that aren't like the basic ones. So custard and more than that. Um, just, I remember the first, the first time I ate after the heavy restriction was just a sweet toast and banana. And that was the best thing I'd had in ages. <laughs> And now when I have it, it's like, it's just, it's not appealing. Mm, it's just food. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember how quickly your hunger cues started to come back? Was it at some point during the meal plan or was it when you got off the meal plan? I'm curious when you started noticing you wanting to eat other than like having to just mechanically eat it was further along in the meal plan because um, I think I kept on going on and off at the beginning of my recovery. So my body was probably like, mm. we can't trust you yet. Um, but it was, yeah, coming to the end of it and I could feel that I was getting hungry for lunch. And when we got our puppy Chester, um, we'd have to get up with him in the morning and it was like four o'clock and I'd feel hungry and I I hated the feeling it was so uncomfortable but um, I just ate and that was the best thing to do absolutely and let's talk about oh no one more question around food then I want to move on to your body which is a journey right um would you say you eat unrestrictedly now day to day yeah I'd say so I mean, with as I said, the extreme hunger makes that easy, but I wouldn't say that I restrict myself of anything because you can tell in the back of your head if I'm saying I want something and then my brain is kind of backing me out of it. I'm like, well, no, that means I have to have it now. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So then the rewiring will be completely done and you won't even get those thoughts to have to just do it anyway. It will just be eating will be easy, natural. It, you're almost there with that. That's so cool. Exactly. So let's talk about weight gain because that's the elephant in the room. People don't talk about it. It's fucking hard. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. So when you started recovery, obviously BMI is bullshit, misunderstood information, but you were you were in anorexia with a, a a seemingly outside looking in thin body not everyone is but you know your experience was how have you and I know I've been there every step but how have you coped with your body changing as it has because that's part of recovery right yeah I mean it's interesting because even when I was in the hospital I do I still didn't think I was sick I didn't think I looked sick at all um and so I think when the recovery started, I just kept on reminding myself that, that the eating disorder was never happy. Mm. Um, even 
like I would look back at the photos of me in hospital and be like god I want to go back to that like being that small but then further along in time I'd look back to the time where I was thinking that and be like I want to go back to that time so it's just trying to stay in every current moment is the best thing to do yeah and what practices or mindset tools that so say save someone's listening who perhaps is on their journey to food freedom oh. perhaps they're, they're going all in perhaps they're following a meal plan and the weight gain is happening because it needs to because the body needs to nourish itself and, and be healthy again is there any advice that you can give someone who feels the same way that you used to feel when the weight gain was happening yeah I mean you've really just got to sit in it like mm. one of my favorite quotes is to sit in the shit like <laughs> yes. know know that it's gonna feel terrible and you really don't like what you look like and where you are right now but do you want to go back like you feel even worse back then so if you feel this discomfort now then over time it's just gonna get easier yeah so it's it's feeling and being with the discomfort, which so many of us, including me, until I started recovery, there was no way around this. We can't run away from difficult feelings. It's it's impossible to recover when without feeling uncomfortable feelings, right? So when you understood that and you really practice, because you've done the work and you continue to do so, when you really practice sitting with the shitty, painful feelings, how... I know it's like not a tangible thing to share, I guess, but how did you do that for someone who has actually never sat with a feeling before and has just restricted or ran away or been busy to stop themselves from feeling what's actually happening? Yeah, that's that's difficult. Um, most people would say, like, cry, let it out. But as you know, I have struggled to do that and... That's part of my grief where tears don't come so easily when I wish they would. Mm. Um, so it's not, sitting with it is not so much about distractions. Like if you need a low level distraction, it would be like reading or puzzles really helped and coloring. Um, but just generally talking to mum um, the people you trust um, and obviously investing in mm. in yourself with a coach an amazing coach thank you thanks Grace <laughs> it's, it's sharing isn't it it's, it's not being isolated in the feelings when that's what we tend to want to do is isolate ourselves because we have a lot of shame feeling the way we feel and when we share it brings the shame into the light and then that automatically starts to fade away over time yeah what was your favorite part about our time together about the kind of the coaching experience that we've had I just remember all of the times where I'd tell you something and then you'd reply like oh that's exactly what I did and <laughs> just how how similar we were and how helpful it was to be able to relate to someone and just know that you're not alone in the amount of like obviously knowledge and experience you have um talking through it and actually realizing that you know I have made progress and I will continue to if I just like have a little Victoria on my shoulder <laughs> I can get through it I love that and what so and you answered this in in the email that I sent you and you sent back but I think it will help others what's the biggest thing you've learned about yourself and life during this experience definitely to trust the process mm. is the first one um like one of our families mantra mantras mantras would be um to take every day as it comes or even take every hour as it comes um 
so that would be the main one. I can't remember what else I said on the email, but yeah, trust the process. Just the process and be in the present moment, I'm hearing you say, because the anxiety, the fear, it likes to jump forward, doesn't it? Oh my God, what if next week, next month, next year? Oh, like, what if, what if, what if? And it's like, okay, let's just, I'm here now on a Thursday afternoon and it's this weather outside and just grounding yourself and being like, right, okay, in this moment now, how do I feel? Is my environment safe? How do I feel about my emotional body? Can I practice accepting the physical body I'm in? And just being here now, because when you're really present, it's easier to feel peace and acceptance. Yeah. Yeah. So if someone was started, perhaps not started their recovery journey yet. So let's say someone who is maybe an avid listener or YouTube watcher of this podcast and they want to recover, but they've not took that step yet because of fear, obviously, that's the thing that's stopping them currently. What kind of words of wisdom or inspiration would you would you share with a, a person who was in that position? I was that person once where I just listened to eating disorder podcasts over and over again and think about taking the action but not actually doing it. Um, but you've really just got to take the jump um, and it's not going to feel like how you imagine it. Recovery is um, random, but so is life and you will find yourself somewhere in the middle of all of it. So just to get good people around you, a good mm -hmm. support system um, and food, because everyone with eating disorders, it's not like, well, not everyone. It's not like we hate food. Like, I think we actually all quite like it and that's why we struggle with it. So just try to focus on all of what you get to taste again and the memories that you get to make. Um, yeah, so it's focusing on the positives of getting your life back during recovery as you're dealing with getting used to your bigger body and letting go of the feeling of control and safety from restriction, focusing on the positives because you and I both know whatever we focus on, we get more of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So question about me, actually, if you were to use three words to describe me, what would they be? Angelic is the first one to come to mind. <laughs> um, then I'd say understanding, because I think even if you've never been through the a similar situation, you can still put yourself in other people's shoes. Mm -hmm. um, and then last one. Uh, so many words to describe. <laughs> <laughs> I just say lovable because I think straight away we bonded mm. um, and that's that's a bond that I don't ever want to go away. It won't. You, I mean, you can message me anytime you know that and you're also in the group, which anyone who doesn't understand, anyone who has one-to-one -one coaching with me, automatically gets free access to the group coaching so when you know you're in there and the other ladies are in there and it's just such a beautiful community isn't it how we all support each other as well yeah exactly yeah so last question grace then I open it up to you to share anything that perhaps I've not asked you that you would like to share how has choosing you starting recovery and and getting coaching how has all of those things changed your life dramatically really um as I said I've now got a puppy which I always wanted when I was younger um and I've got a mentor to start looking at jobs I'm learning to drive and that's stressful but <laughs> I've got grief counseling the main reason why I started recovery was to to grieve for dad mm. so although I wouldn't say that 
I really have or I've made I've made it through I'm like I feel more emotions than Mm. I used to and that's a big thing for me yeah that's huge to feel and that's part of life we and we can't when we open our when we put our walls down and allow emotions in we can't say I only want to feel love joy I only want this selection of emotions obviously when the wall is down all emotions come to us and that is the gift of life when we practice not labeling our emotions as good or bad not labeling days as good or bad and just being like it was a day it was a challenging day but it wasn't a necessarily a bad day or this is a uncomfortable emotion but it's not a bad emotion it's just an emotion that feels uncomfortable because most of the time when something feels uncomfortable it's because we're resisting it yeah I've noticed that within myself whenever I'm uncomfortable about something I'm like wait I'm resisting somewhere otherwise I wouldn't feel uncomfortable I would just feel the emotion itself Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, and last question actually although I said that was the last one I want to ask you something that I perhaps haven't been able to support you in deeply because I've not experienced it myself but you might be able to help others um in the depression is that what has helped you on the days where you've just literally had no energy, no zest for life, no nothing, like what has helped you during those times? Actually, food in a way. I remember feeling guilty just because the only thing each day that I'd look forward to was eating. Mm. Um, But that's not a bad thing. learning that and slowly getting through each day and then finding more things to do or to look forward to is you know what keeps you going and depression is like up and down obviously so just as I as we quote taking every day as it comes yeah I remember that actually in a few coaching calls back reflecting remembering when you had something to look forward to even if it wasn't something now it helped lift you out of the depression in that moment so whether anyone listening if this is resonating with you whether you can book something or arrange something if you can feel you can do that in that moment to bring you up to look forward to something when you perhaps you know not feeling it now yeah I'd recommend that too oh Gracie is there anything else that I've not asked you that you want to share because share away people want to hear from you if you and don't worry if not I'm just curious if there's anything that wants to come through you to share um I mean I'd say work with Victoria (laughs) I'm not paying her I promise (laughs) (laughs) that you won't regret it and I just with my dad I think about how proud he would be um how much he'd love you as well and just the grief as I said is the main reason why I started but now there's so much more like doing it for myself it's the biggest thing and as I remember you saying um for me to ask dad for a sign during our first podcast I've had so many signs since then and I I just think that's crazy that is yeah do you mind do I remember I'm sure you do do you remember what what you asked for the and this was before you'd ever even asked for a sign at all and maybe you might have been like okay Vic that's weird but I'm gonna do it what did you ask for and what was shown to you from your dad in the spirit world so the first one the one you told me to the first time was the red balloons Um, and that wasn't what I told you to but you got you got that through your what did yeah. you do? How do you... So if you were sharing to someone how they would ask for a sign from one of their loved ones that's passed, like, what did you do? I just sat in a quiet space, like a comfortable um, like room in my house and closed my eyes 
and just said out loud, Dad, give me a sign, uh, please. And then just waited for a bit. And whatever came to my head, I just, that was the sign. And I didn't think it would work. But as you said, what Julia's was, um, mm -hmm. mine was a red balloon. That was the first thing that came to my head. So I just thought, right, okay, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. And I think the first place I saw it was on one of my games, with literally an hour or so later. Um, I was like, wow, that's a bit of a coincidence. <laughs> and then I didn't realise but the King's coronation was that weekend and there was red balloons everywhere. <laughs> and so I was freaking out a little. And I just... I asked him again after that like can I have another sign and what came to my head was Red Bull mm -hmm. like the drink or that and I thought well I'm never gonna <laughs> see that really <laughs> and but then I was at a friend's house and the Formula One was on in the background and I just remember the Red Bull team came first, second, and third. And I went outside to call mum and I was like, mum, you won't believe it. Wow. I mean, I mean, of course I believe in this stuff. I guide you when, I guide clients whenever they're ready. They don't have to be spiritual. Of course they don't. I have many clients who aren't, but those that are, to, to be able to guide you in this space as well, it's just, it's life-changing, isn't it? Because Yes, he's not here in physical form anymore, but he's still here. You can still connect with him. You just have to be open and quiet and able to receive. And of course, in the depth of an eating disorder, when all you can think about is food in your body, you're unable to create that space to connect. So such a beautiful journey you've been on and that you are on as well, Grace. Thank you in public. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for trusting me to guide you and to support you it's been an absolute pleasure and like I say it's not over but it's really been a pleasure so thank you Grace yeah. and I love you to bits thank you I should be thanking you more I just appreciate it so much you coming into my life and helping me out as well no you're oh. welcome Grace thank you. <laughs> all right queens listening i hope that well i know that this episode it will be very inspiring to you so please let us know um what you think about this episode grace can i um in the show notes can i put an ins an instagram of yours or or something linked? Yeah. yeah i could do the i could send you the second one because that's what i i post on so please yeah, yeah. there's a few of you and i don't know which one to put so you send me which one you want me to link and then I will link yeah. it below. Oh, and I also um, just wanted to mention that I am doing a skydive for the hospice that my dad was in. So I didn't know if I could put my fundraiser in the show notes. Please do. Oh, yes, yeah. please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, my God, a skydive. I've done one and I absolutely loved it. When is it? August. So quite a way away. But obviously you have to raise quite a bit of money and I just like I did for the bungee jump I want to do it for dad and I'm yeah. very excited yeah so we would be so grateful if you could just donate anything that you can to support this funding and just just let me know grace how let me in know grace that doesn't make sense let me and grace know what you thought of the difference between the first episode i'll also link that under the show notes too so people can easily find the first conversation we had compared to now i mean you were a world of there's a diff world of difference apart it's incredible and you're amazing grace amazing Thanks. grace that's the song right or something yes we won't sing it I won't sing I don't even know how it gets oh I think I do but I won't yeah I won't I'll save you <laughs> um, okay. but thank you for your time Grace and listeners much love we'll see you on another episode yeah.